And so, <laughs> I think we're talking about making it real. Um, I don't know how much there is to say about fire hazard. Are you going to talk about fire hazard? No. He's not going to talk about fire hazard. They run the city, actually, which means you run around getting really lost and stretched out. Um, I did that with James over there. We're way there. We did pretty well. Um, 13 out of 14 is actually pretty successful. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I'm going to let them talk about bringing these games to real life now, and this is the part where you clap really loudly and I hand the mic over. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I remember your run. That was a pretty impressive run. Actually, I'm not totally sure the 14th team showed up, but anyway, <laughs> good work. Um, we actually have a multiple repeat winner of Super Dash here. I'll, I'll get more on that later on. Um, is it you? No, I lose this game every time I play it. And I do go in as a player sometimes. It's really embarrassing. Mostly I don't these days. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm Gwyn Morphy. I run Fire Hazard Games. We do real world games rather than video games, running and screaming out in the real world. Um, I love computer games, but there's always this barrier between you and the game world. I mean, you may be like running around jumping off rooftops and things, but actually you're sitting in a chair with a mouse and a, an LCD sized portal into the, the world you're trying to inhabit. And that's a pity. There's lots of ways to solve this. One of them uh, you heard Rob talking about in the first talk, which is that you use some really specialist, impressive hardware to drag the player into the game world. You, you put a mask on them, it eventually we'll start doing things with gloves and things or whatever and, and bring them into the world. That's one way to do it and it's a really cool way to do it and it's getting there. But there is another way which is that you drag the game world over to the player. You go and run these kind of games out in the real world. Uh, and that's what I'm doing. So what I'm going to talk about is the process of designing those games. Now, I love computer games and I don't want to leave all of them behind when we make this transition to the real world because there's some really powerful moments in games. Um, there's some really memorable things happening there. I'm sure all of you have had your favorite games, your memorable moments, whatever it is. If you've played XCOM, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to keep that, particularly given that I'm trying to make accessible games, things people can get into really quickly. To do that, you need recognizable moments. You, you haven't got sort of hours of, of backstory or character building or things like that. You need to drag people in, which means they need to be able to recognize very quickly what's going on. So we've got this great source in video games and to some extent in movies of really powerful, memorable, recognizable moments. Let's translate those into the real world so that we can get rid of that barrier between the player and the game world and, and make them the heroes of it. So I'm going to talk about the, the process of translating from those moments into real world games. Uh, this is one of my favorites. The, um, this particular moment, I actually first encountered it in the movie Reservoir Dogs. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this. All right, let me just say this out loud because I want to get this straight in my head. You're saying that Mr. Blonde was going to kill you, and then when we got back, he was going to kill us, take the satchel of diamonds, and scram. I'm right about that, right? That's correct. That's your story? I swear on my mother's attorney. You know how this is going to end. Uh, okay, so that's the, the movie version. That moment's being recreated in computer games, uh, in a few, but this is Red Dead Redemption. Prepare yourselves. Draw. That was cool. <laughs> so let's try and make that in the real world uh, without killing anyone. <laughs> <laughs> or everybody in the, the case of, of Reservoir Dogs. Um, so the process for making it real is this. First, think about what is it exactly that we want to create? What is the essence of that moment? And for me, particularly in the Reservoir Dogs scene, the essence of it is that actually nobody wants to kill anybody. Like, they start off with the, the genuinely trying to sort this out with a conversation. Nobody wants to pull a gun. Uh, everybody is aware that if anybody shoots, it's going to be lose-lose for everyone. That's really powerful. 
And that sense of escalating doom, as emotions start to run higher, people start to lose control, people start taking irrevocable and, and incredibly destructive actions, like pulling a gun out makes you a target. Um, and then it all changes in about a second. You go from people standing around not doing very much to everybody is dead on the floor in about <coughs> 24 frames. It's amazing. That is the essence of that moment. Same thing with Red Dead Redemption. You don't have all of the arguing and the shouting at the start, but you've still got that incredibly dramatic scene where it, it's all resolved in about a second at the end of that. So that's what we want to create. We started testing some game designs that do this in a format called Standoff. Um, it's kind of similar to Cash and Guns, if you've played that. Um, cash and Guns is great, but it's still it's not real time. Fundamentally, you're still turn based and you still know that you're going to pull a gun and you're going to fire. And I wanted to have a little bit more of an open world feel to it than that. I wanted sometimes people to be able to talk things out. So you never really know if it's going to turn into a shootout or not. Which, in Reservoir Dogs, you don't know until somebody pulls the trigger. And then you're like, oh my god, ah. So the deal with standoff is, OK, you're crims, you're sitting around a table, you're splitting the loot from your, your last job. Um, you've all got guns. But they're under your chairs to start with, because we're going to settle this with a conversation, right? You can reach for your gun whenever you like, and you can do it as slowly and subtly or as dramatically as you want. Uh, there's no turns. Gun fights are resolved in real time. So if you want to shoot someone, the way you do it is by shooting them. Uh, dying shots are allowed. So if you're holding your gun on someone and somebody shoots you, you're allowed to pull the trigger on your own gun as you go down. That's all. You can't re-aim. You can't do anything else. But that means it, that holding guns in a Mexican standoff actually has gameplay value. It's one of the things you want to do. Then to create that conversation, that argument at the start, uh, we give everybody hidden information. We tell some people that other people's guns are unloaded. We tell some people that the painting isn't worth anything, and so on. Uh, and we add a whole stack of time pressure. Because we say, all right, you guys have got somewhere between one and three minutes until the cops get here, and we're not telling you when that happens. <laughs> Sometimes we play sirens in the background if we feel like stressing them out a bit more. Um, and it works. What happens, and these are photos from the playtest we did at Campfire uh, a few months back. A very, very low fi obviously. I think I looped his, his candles and plastic turtles because that's what we had. Um, the turtles were worth five times as much as, anyway. Um, it starts off like this, right? Everybody is being very civilized. And in some of the rounds, because we did a lot of rounds of this, um, they actually sorted it out like gentlemen. They, they came to an amicable solution. Nobody died. They split up the loot, and we went to the next round, and I put some more pressure on them to try to stop that happening again. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really cool to see that they had the option. But generally what happened is quite quickly, it starts to look like this. <laughs> and generally once that has happened, you are a few seconds away from this. <laughs> Mission accomplished. It, it makes that moment. It, it, you kind of feel like you're in Reservoir Dogs, and like Reservoir Dogs, most of the time, you die. So speaking of impending doom, this is another moment I really like. Um, and you'll encounter this in, well, a whole series of video games. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember the 1999 Alien vs Predator on PC. It looked a bit like this. <laughs> yeah, it was really dark and you couldn't see anything. Yeah, okay. It was slightly brighter than that. Um, but what we have there, this is, I'm another victim, by the way, of, of building the presentation on the back and, and translating. Hence the fonts, not my choice either. Um, what we have there is a Marine Mort working his way through some reasonably dark, but not that dark tunnels. Um, and headshotting aliens. No worries, uh, they never really get too close to him. Um, and the reason that was working for him is that he was staying calm. If you stay calm in that game, you're basically okay. When I play it, it looks a bit more like this. <laughs> <laughs> that was a clip minus the sound from Aliens, uh, the, the bit where it all goes wrong uh, under the reactor. Um, and the moment I'm trying to create there in both games is this thinking that you really should win this. I mean, come on. You've got these massive great guns. Um, you can basically one-shot the enemy. The enemy has to run all the way up to you. I mean, the enemy has brought claws to a gunfight. 
Uh, this should not go well for you. Um, but you panic, you freak out, and then you die. That's a really powerful moment. Let's try to do that. So we're trying to build a real world game around <laughs> panicking and then getting killed when you really shouldn't. And we keep the same bits from the video game and from the movie as well. We give the players overwhelmingly powerful weapons. In this case, we give them multi-shot nerf guns. They've got a range of all the way across the room. They fire about a shot a second. They're clip fed. They're one-shot kills against the opponents, which well, generally we use zombies, sometimes aliens, it doesn't matter. Uh, if we use zombies, you not only outrange the enemy, you're faster than them as well. You have no excuse for not winning this. Uh, but then we create the panic. We rig it so that you have to split up. So you haven't got time to reach all the objectives if you stay together. So you've got to scatter. Uh, you've got poor vision because it's dark. We're playing at night in a forest. We have poor communications because we haven't given you the radios for this one. All you can do is shout. Uh, and we make sure you don't have any decent leadership by not giving you time to appoint any. You've got a few seconds to set up and then you're in. And what happens is pretty much what happens in that clip from the movie. Um, people start off really cocky and calm and frosty and they spread out there, they check the corners, they're looking good. Um, and then somebody screws up and they get ambushed and somebody dies. And people start to lose their nerve. And then they start to make mistakes, people miss their shots, they run out of ammunition, they fire at each other by accident, they get lost, and it all goes to hell. And then the screaming starts and it's over. <laughs> it's pretty predictable actually. Most teams last about 10 minutes. The screaming starts at about 5 and then it goes down. It's great. People enjoy this. <laughs> So yeah, we, we've created that moment, and it's something that people remember as well. And the fun thing is, you, once you've created that moment, you can then tinkle with it. One of the things we did is went, okay, what happens if we give them a leadership? What if instead of going three, two, one, you're in, we go, all right guys, four minutes squads of four, appoint leaders. You give them five minutes to sort themselves out, do the politics, whatever, then you send them out. And the funny thing is they win. They actually do all right at this point. It, it's great, you've created another moment for people like that, and a bit of hero support. That better not be a screensaver. <laughs> yeah. So that's Outbreak. This is another one you might recognize. Stealth games are great for this kind of stuff. Um, Metal Gear that's Solid is pretty much where it's at, although also Thief is brilliant for this kind of thing. Or if you've played Amnesia, where you don't do <laughs> If you've dared to play Amnesia, where you don't get a weapon at all and you spend the entire game hiding, uh, tell me that's not an incredibly intense experience. So let's try to make those. Um, this is from Metal Gear Online. Well, it's being very quiet. Uh, but that was a sneaking along through a patrol and then a stealth takedown on one of the opponents and now sneaking back around behind the enemy. There's a bunch of really cool mechanics in here. Um, the obvious ones are being pinned. So if you're hidden under a table or something like that, uh, and an enemy patrol comes past, and maybe you're under that table and they are right here, whistling or smoking a cigarette or something like that, and you're just terrified for the, the couple of minutes it takes them to go away. That's a powerful scene. Or if you're, you're on the move, the other one is if you spot an enemy patrol route and then either distract the guard with the old soda can, oh, what was that, I better check it out, um, or just timing it and then slipping through the patrol. That's a, a incredibly memorable moment for players as well. Um, or there's the stealth takedown, sneaking up behind someone who would normally, you couldn't get anywhere near, taking them out from behind. Um, or there's the, oh shit, uh, which you saw in, in that clip there where you think you're being stealthy, suddenly you realize you're not, and it all goes to hell very quickly. Uh, these are all moments we can create in real world games. So I use these mechanics a lot because I love them. Um, there's a few different formats. Um, so Heist and City Dash in a very different setup, but the same basic mechanic. The thing that really makes the stealth mechanic work is sight kills. So instead of your opponent needing to touch you, like an outbreak or shoot you or anything like that, they only have to see you. Turns out humans are quite good at seeing things. So this is an incredibly <laughs> powerful attack. Um, so really the problem then is balancing it. Actually, people suck at stealth, except for those guys. 
<laughs> more on that soon. Um, and so you've got to balance it out. Um, the way you do that really is not so much with mechanics as in just ridiculously unbalancing the game to start with. So you don't have many guards, you have a lot of players. And then you, you brief the guards as well. For heist, we have to do this. We make them slow and predictable. We basically tell them, be the worst computer AI you've ever seen. <laughs> if, if a can lands over there, you go, oh, what was that noise? <laughs> it was probably nothing. <laughs> At which point, players, because they've played these games, they recognize these moments from computer games, will start doing that, and they will feel like absolute legends. When they throw a snowball over there, you go over to investigate, and somebody with a stun gun, it's a Nerf gun, not a real stun gun, steps out from behind a container and caps you in the back of the head at point blank. And then as a guard, you spend the next five minutes lying on the ground, actually in the snow in this case. But the player feels like an absolute hero, and it's brilliant. You've made that moment for there's a lot of actor skill in this one, much more than in the other mechanics, um, because you have to use your peripheral vision to work out where the players actually are, so that you don't walk onto them. You, you figure out where they are, and then you work out a patrol route that will take you past them in such a way that if they're really good, they'll dodge you, and if they screw it up, they'll be obvious and you'll spot them. Now the important thing is that if you do, well, if they see you see them, then you've got to spot them at that point. Because we're not scripting this, we're not making cutscenes, we're making games. People's actions have to have consequences, and if you start scripting it, players will figure that out very fast, uh, and then they're not in the game world. Well so you have to balance between making it actually possible and making it genuine. Um, I've actually had some people genuinely escape me, where I, I literally had no idea they were there at all, and they told me afterwards, and that's always brilliant. That makes a moment for the player and also for the guards. I had one where the photographer saw the player sneaking past me, and I didn't see them either. But then again, I'm not that good at this game. <laughs> so it's actually really hard to get footage of this. Um, I hope the sound works for this one, uh, because we're trying not to see people. Uh, but this is the headcanon on Team Super Awesome Dragon Fireball, who've won City Dash about five times in a row <laughs> now, uh, timing a patrol route and slipping past it. Yeah, here we go. Yep. <laughs> that does sound like my uh, City Dash experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that the second moment was, was that, oh god, we've been spotted moment I was telling you about. Uh, we didn't script that, but we set up a situation that I was hoping it was going to happen, which is that we had a slow checkpoint in a phone box where you had to make a phone call from there. Um, and that there was a guard patrol around that phone box. And so if the team screws up and doesn't bother to figure out where the guard is before they go in, they get busted. That's the kind of moments you can create. So that's some of the stuff I've been playing with. There's a lot more things I want to make games out of. Um, Left 4 Dead's rescue mechanics are great for this. Um, if you're not familiar with Left 4 Dead, the, the core mechanic here is a, you're a four-player co-op against about 100 million zombies. Um, but a lot of the zombies have special powers and it can paralyze one of your team members. Effectively, you get down, and if you're not rescued quite quickly, you die. Uh, so you're constantly having to make decisions about, well, do we risk everything to go back and save that guy, or do we leave him to his stupid fate because he shouldn't have wandered off like that and go and finish the mission? Um, either way, those are decisions players remember, and you can put those into to real world games quite easily. Uh, we do it with one where we have an enemy that can only knock you down it can't actually transform you. Other players can come and rescue you, or if they don't, and you end up sitting there for long enough you get bored, then you change sides. So there's an incentive to go and get people, otherwise you're going to be facing them later, but you don't have to. There's also the document handovers from um, one of the Bourne movies, uh, which I'm currently turning into a game called Undercover, about stealthily uh, passing documents around. There's the ransom sequence in Dirty Harry, which is just brilliant, and as soon as I find enough <coughs> working payphones in a row, I'm going to build that. <laughs> it's getting harder and harder. Um, and then there's self-sacrifice and, and heroism mechanics from almost any game. Um, players love these kind of things. The, the life or death decisions, the things that let you feel incredibly powerful, where you make it a difference in the game. And they're all over video games, and all you've got to do is spot those moments, ideally ones players are familiar with, uh, and then figure out the core mechanics and bring them into a real-world game. And if you do this, players will absolutely love you for it. 
it's what they're there to do. They want to feel larger than life. They want to feel like heroes. And if you can do that for them in the real world, that's a, a massive win. So yeah, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I would love to hear thoughts, feedback, comments, things like that. That's where you can find me, whether you want to play or want to come and make games, or even just you had an incredibly memorable moment in a video game and you want to see if we can turn that into the real world. I'd, I'd love to hear about that stuff. Uh, in the meantime, I've probably got some time. Does anyone have any questions? Yo. Um, you've spoken a lot about what live games can learn from films and video games. I know there's a lot of game developers in the audience. What can they learn from live games? Hmm. Um, live games, I think, are, are quite a new genre at the moment. So I, I would hesitate to try to teach video games too much. They've got, done some incredible developments in, in story and characterization and things like that. Um, what you, I get from live games is because you're actually there, all the experiences get much more intense. And they're social experiences as well. What we're trying to do is create stories that people will tell afterwards. Um, and people like telling them because they, they can tell a lot of people who are there. A lot of my intense video game experiences, like if I got to be up here and talk to you for 10 minutes about all the shit that's happened to me in XCOM, you would probably find that really boring. Live games, that's less of an issue. So I think with video games, well, particularly this move towards co-op, particularly multiplayer co-op, I think is brilliant. That's what creates those kind of bonds. Yo. Um, <coughs> I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that it's uh, that you have a lot of kind of urban-based things. Have you run anything or thought about running anything in like a forest or a rural environment? Because it might be that humans end up being more able or less able to hide like in a in a forest than they would be on the street. I'm just curious whether you run anything. So we do a, a series of night games up on, well, previously Hampstead Heath, we're probably going to have to move over to Epic Forest, which does that. That because must be terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, it's terrifying. Have you never the police before? No. <laughs> <laughs> They'll come if we need them. We <laughs> Actually, that is really creepy. We did a Halloween game up there, and it was misty. So you could not see a damn thing. It was Halloween. Everybody was in costume. And I mean, I was freaking out. And I was running the games. So I don't know how the players were feeling. Awesome. Yo. Um, you're saying sort of uh, live games are quite new genre. So what interaction do you have with the uh, like, Have you been sweating? Or, or what do you know of that, kind of, that genre of games? Good call, actually, because LARP's been around for a long time. Um, I've played a little bit of it. I'm in a slightly different space, so I don't know much about LARP because I'm one of the things I really like about computer games is they're accessible. I can come home, flop on the couch, and play for an hour, or something like that. LARP to me seems like it's much more of an investment, because you have persistent characters and persistent worlds, generally. And I'm trying to make games where I can get people in and out in an hour, hour and a half. Which means I have to do all this cliche, recognizable stuff. I think if you're playing for six months, the kind of stuff I've got here would be so shallow that it wouldn't be interesting. Yeah, uh, have you ever tried to recreate Slender? We're pretty what? You know, pop slender, we have to. No. You're in a forest oh, and you have to collect eight pages. There is a slender. Oh, yeah. slender! Yeah. Oh, God! Oh! Oh, no! I was also in the forest deep, and we tried recreating slender. Uh, the guy who played slender man was such a very good black, and he was the only one who had a black vision. God, we'll see God, that was it. And we, it was a group of four of us in the forest deep. And we put eight pages in that like, circle of area. Only the Slender Man knew where these pages was. <laughs> and we all, we, all had, we all had flashlights, but of course, the guy who was essentially DMing the entire experience put faulty batteries in all the flashlights. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, think I, really, I think I was the last one to sort of survive, but could you kind of, have you ever tried doing something like that? We're doing this tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun as hell. It's basically, I mean, people like you trust that yeah. something you like scare the absolute living day like that. I'll make sure you tell everyone in Sorry Gara we are doing this. Don't call the police. <laughs> but yeah, give it a shot. It's fun. Wicked. I'll, I'll do, totally do that. Yeah. Maybe go on some isolated spot and be every far from that. But less happens. <laughs> cool. Um, 
How much time have we got? Well, that's, that's all questions. <laughs> all right, thanks, guys.